Welcome to Viasat's FY20 third quarter earnings conference call. Your host for today's call is Mark Dankbert, Chairman and CEO. You may proceed, Mr. Dankbert. Yeah, thanks. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Viasat's earnings call for our third fiscal quarter of 2020. Uh, so I'm Mark Denkberg, Chairman and CEO, and also on the call with me are Rick Baldridge, our President and Chief Operating Officer, Sean Duffy, our CFO, Robert Blair, General Counsel, Bruce Stokes, our Treasurer, and Paul Froelich in Corporate Development. And before we start, Robert will provide our safe harbor disclosure. Thanks, Mark. As you know, this discussion will contain forward-looking statements. This is a reminder that factors could cause actual results to differ materially, Additional information concerning these factors is contained in our SEC filings, including our most recent reports on Form 10-K and Form 10-Q. Copies are available from the SEC or from our website. With that said, let me turn it back over to Mark. Thanks, Robert. So we'll be referring to slides that are available over the web. I'll start with an overview, and Sean will discuss the consolidated and segment-level financial results. And then I'll give more color on the business, progress on Viasat 3, our global expansion plans, and update our outlook. Financial results continue to be strong. Revenue of $588 million for Q3 is up 6% year over year, and $1.7 billion year to date is up 14% compared to last year. EBITDA of $122 million for third quarter is up 13% year over year, and at $337 million year to date is 46% higher than last year. Year-to-date orders of $1.8 billion are slightly above last year and reflect a book-to-bill of just over one times. The financial results demonstrate strong business fundamentals. We're scaling and refining and improving execution. We're able to deliver solid gains while investing for future growth. In the near to midterm, aeronautical broadband, both government and commercial, has great growth potential. We're aiming to translate the accomplishments and market share gains we've achieved in North American in-flight connectivity on a global basis, and we're making significant progress. By the nature of how government platforms are deployed, global expansion opportunities are already in motion. Government systems is firing on all cylinders and creating more opportunities from network effects across several product lines. One of our strategic themes is diversifying our satellite services portfolio to increase resilience grow our total addressable market, and prepare for global coverage. We've shown progress every quarter. While we're efficiently driving revenue and earnings growth in U.S. fixed site service, our other markets are growing even faster. We're entering each vertical market and methodically expanding geographically. We have a very substantial growth runway in front of us. Our strategy is being proven. Our highly unique form of vertical integration in space and ground technology and service delivery underpins a unified global approach with tailored playbooks for specific applications in geographic regions. Through our work in platform-specific terminal integration, end-user applications integration, machine learning, data analytics, and cybersecurity, we're delivering impactful outcomes for our customers, not just bandwidth. But we definitely intend to maintain our leadership in cost-efficient production of space-based bandwidth in the places with the greatest demand. We believe we're exceptionally well-positioned for long-term growth. Mastering a broad service portfolio is so valuable because each region of the world has dramatically distinct demand profiles driven by vastly different geographic, economic, political, and regulatory realities on the ground. A diverse portfolio is far more resilient to the kind of economic and geopolitical disruptions the world is experiencing right now. Vertical integration offers exceptional synergies across the portfolio, extending economic advantages, especially given our unique network architecture allowing flexible geographic bandwidth allocations across time and space. Finally, the aggregate demand represented by our target service portfolio far exceeds the supply of space-based bandwidth being brought to market not only by us, but by the entire industry. We anticipate 2020 will mark a major milestone for the Viasat 3 constellation as we ship our first fully assembled, integrated, and tested Viasat 3 payload module. From then on, the rest of the spacecraft integration and launch campaign builds on existing standard processes and schedules to achieve a mid-2021 launch. 
and we've made important strides in the next evolution, Biosat 4, that reinforces our confidence in preserving and extending our leadership in the primary satellite broadband value propositions of bandwidth and speed relative to any geo, meo, or leo alternatives. So after we review the financials, I'll go into more depth on each of the areas I've highlighted here. So for financial highlights, this slide clearly illustrates the summary financials I mentioned up front. Just to recap, QP revenue of $588 million is up 6% year-over-year, and at $1.7 billion year-to-date is up 14%. Q3 adjusted EBITDA at $122 million is up 13% year-over-year, and $337 million year-to-date is up 46%. Year-over-year, Q3 awards of $577 million are up 29% year-over-year. Year-to-date awards of $1.9 billion are up 5% year-over-year. And they reflect a year-to-date book-to-bill of better than $1.11. Overall, we continue to set the pace for the broadband space industry. Our revenue run rates are the highest with a solid growth rate. Virtually all our major markets are growth markets. We're the most vertically end-to-end integrated, from fundamental space and ground technology to end-user and customer service delivery. The strategy is simple. The execution is tricky and difficult, but we're doing it. It's what creates competitive moats. We think anyone aiming to deliver global broadband service at scale is going to have to master the skills and markets that we are. Finally, it should be clear from the last several quarters that availability of cost-effective bandwidth in the right geographic places is the fuel driving our growth. We're benefiting from Viasat 2 and the international satellite partnerships that replenished our bandwidth supply. Later on, we'll help investors better visualize the economic potential of the bandwidth fuel coming with the approaching Viasat 3 launches. So with that backdrop, I'll turn it over to Sean. Thanks, Mark. As as Mark just covered the top-level highlights, I'll jump right into our segment performance. The momentum in our government business continues to drive growth, with third quarter reflecting strong performance in both top lines and earnings. Segment revenues grew $42 million, or 17% year-over-year, with higher product sales occurring across our diverse portfolio, including tactical radios, mobile broadband, tactical data links, and government SATCOM products. This comes on the heels of a very good Q2, which historically is a seasonally good book and ship award quarter for us corresponding with the government's fiscal year-end budget closeout on September 30th. So we expect our government business to continue its strong performance into Q4, easily exceeding the $1 billion revenue threshold for FY20 that I mentioned last quarter. Adjusted EBITDA for government systems was $78 million, representing a 13% increase over Q3 of last year. The higher top line drove this growth, as improved gross margins on higher NDI product mix from the prior period was offset by a modest uptick in SGNA. Segment awards in the quarter were $232 million, up almost 50% year-over-year to a new Q3 record and resulting in a positive year-to-date book-to-build position. Government backlog stood at $928 million at the end of the quarter, and that excludes the IDIQ values Mark mentioned earlier and approximately $450 million in remaining AMSS contract options, which, to remind everyone, is the contract we have to provide to elite global in-flight connectivity services on the U.S. government senior leader aircraft. Turning to commercial networks, we saw quarterly revenues decline by $42 million, or 33%, due entirely to the comparative impact of last year's spike in the IFC terminal installations for American Airlines offset with other modest commercial product increases. And despite the continued grounding of the 737 MAX, our IFC terminal deliveries ticked up sequentially, quarter over quarter, as mounting interest for an out-home, in-flight internet experience drives IFC demand globally. Commercial Network's Q3 earnings reflected a larger adjusted EBITDA loss on the lower revenues, as well as higher next-gen satellite networks and mobile terminal R&D, and to a lesser extent, higher SG&A. But awards for the quarter were very strong, at $134 million, with antenna systems and commercial air terminals representing over 80% of this total. And we ended the quarter with backlog of $385 million, which is the highest backlog position we've had in this segment over the last five years. 
Lastly, in satellite services, we continue to see strong revenue growth and even stronger adjusted EBITDA increases as the inherent operating leverage and our large-scale service businesses expand in Biosat 2. This quarter also marked our eighth quarter of sequential revenue growth, with Q3 revenues hitting a record $212 million, representing a 19% year-over-year increase and a 3% on a quarter-over-quarter basis. And while our overall broadband service portfolio continues to expand, our U.S. consumer broadband business is still growing, generating an all-time revenue high this Q3 and contributing about two-thirds of the Q3 revenue increase, with our IFC business representing the bulk of the remainder. In consumer broadband, revenues reflected a 15% year-over-year increase in ARPU, primarily from a higher premium service plan mix, while our commercial air top-line expansion was twofold. The biggest part was driven by a 23% year-over-year increase in tails in service, alongside increased ARPA from our expanding onboard capabilities and services. Our ending in-service tail count was 1379 aircraft, which excludes about 90 Boeing 737 MAX planes that already have Biosat services enabled, but remain grounded as of the end of the quarter. Q3 adjusted EBITDA for the satellite service segment was up over $18 million, or 33% year-over-year to $75.1 million. The flow-through of incremental revenue to adjusted EBITDA of 54% was a little lower than what we've seen in the past, primarily related to our global expansion investments, which offset the incremental contribution margins from our scaling fixed residential and mobility businesses. With respect to our activities abroad, things are continuing to look promising. While our revenue base is small, it is growing as expected. But more importantly, we are making good progress in building our in-country execution capabilities, including gaining local expertise, forming distribution relationships, and establishing the operating infrastructure we need as we ready for the bias at three consolation. Now, before I move on, let me touch on the impact of the continuing 737 MAX grounding. Last quarter, I said that the reduced number of the 737 MAX installs and delay in related service revenues could result in fiscal year earnings pressures in the $5 million to $10 million range based on a return to flight in the calendar year-end timeframe, and that we would likely be at the higher end of that range. Based on Boeing's most recent public statements, We don't anticipate a return to flight before the end of fiscal year, so we can now confirm that the full fiscal 2020 earnings impact will be approximately $10 million. These financial pressures are likely to carry into fiscal 2021. However, as we said before, we anticipate a step function in commercial air revenues when these planes return to service. But again, for clarity, overall, we expect to see solid satellite services segment momentum continuing into next year with revenue and adjusted EBITDA growth on a year-over-year basis. So to recap, we had another solid quarter, year-over-year, of top-line and adjusted EBITDA results across our key business segments. And we expect to continue this trend as we close out the year and into fiscal 2021. And we have a good revenue line of sight based on our backlog position of $1.9 billion, up about 5% from the same period last year. So this next slide has our year-to-date results and consistent with our performance throughout fiscal 2020, we see year-to-date revenue and adjusted EBITDA expansion fueled by our prior technology portfolio investments. To size this a bit more, the last 12 months, of adjusted EBITDA totaled over $445 million, which is over $100 million higher than our historical high. And as I previously highlighted, we see good momentum continuing next year. In the government segment, we saw year-to-date revenue growth of 25% to $852 million, a new high for that segment. The drivers of this top-line growth were basically the same product categories I mentioned in the quarterly results. Segment adjusted EBITDA was up 47 million or 27% year over year to 222 million with just under a half of a percent improvement in margins 
as a result of lower SG&E as a percentage of revenue. In commercial networks, revenues were down 25% to $252 million on the anticipated lower aero terminal shipments year over year. But that was partially offset by higher revenues in satellite networking, antenna systems, and fixed broadband products. Adjusted EBITDA decreased $23 million year over year on the combination of the lower revenue and the higher absolute SG&A and R&D expenses supporting our next-gen satellite networks and our growing mobile broadband business. And in satellite services, revenues were up 24% year-to-date, while adjusted EBITDA was up significantly more at 63%, or $82 million over the same period. Top-line growth and margin expansion were driven by the same scaling factors I discussed on the quarterly results. Going forward, even with the investments we're making in our international fixed and mobile broadband businesses and our other vertical markets, we still expect to see continued solid year-over-year absolute adjusted EBITDA growth in this segment. On slide seven, we have income, cash flows, and that leverage trends for the quarter. Operating income, income improved substantially for the quarter and the year-to-date period, driven mostly by the improvement in adjusted EBITDA and partially upset by the higher non-cash expenses such as depreciation and amortization. Positive net income for the quarter and a large decrease in the year-to-date net loss reflects our operating income improvements, as well as lower interest expense incurred and capitalization of interest as the construction of the Viasat 3 constellation continues. In taxes, our Q3 and year-to-date periods reflect our federal R&D tax credit benefits, offsetting the additional tax expense on our higher income levels. Collectively, this brought our third quarter gap net income to $6.5 million and non-gap net income to $25 million. Year-to-date, we again saw similar trends with the improved gap net income by $68 million year-over-year, bringing our year-to-date gap results to about break-even and non-gap net income to $52 million, a $72 million improvement. Looking at year-to-date Q3 cash flows, we generated $293 million of cash from operations, which was up 37% or almost $80 million compared to the same period last year. This increase was primarily driven by our strong year-over-year adjusted EBITDA increase, partially upset by additional working capital supporting our growth. Capital expenditures increased by $255 million year-over-year, with about two-thirds of this increase due to last year's investments being offset by the $172 million of Biosat 2 insurance payments. The remaining CapEx increase was associated with the Biosat 3 constellation, partially upset by lower CPE and Biosat 2 ground spend. Overall, our existing business strength, which is fueled by our approximately 400 gigabit of high-capacity KA band portfolio, greatly expanded our operating cash flow generation, and it funded roughly about 50% of our year-to-date CapEx. So moving to leverage on the lower right corner of the chart, our Q3 net leverage position increased slightly from last quarter as expected, but it's still down significantly year over year. As noted in prior calls, we expect leverage to hover in this range or perhaps increase slightly next quarter, depending on the timing of certain capital outlays. Looking to fiscal 2021, we expect leverage to continue to increase modestly as we and our subcontractors hit a wave of critical milestones alongside our transition to the final phase of our Viasat 3 program construction activities. But again, against a backdrop of expected continued strong growth in our adjusted EBITDA performance. Finally, we have continued to have ample liquidity of just over $600 million dollars which includes the cash on the balance sheet and the availability under a $700 million revolving credit facility. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Mark. Thanks, Sean. Okay, so I'll go into more depth, starting with government systems. Uh, just to recap, third quarter revenue was up 17% year-over-year to $292 million, and year-to-date up 25% to $852 million. And year-to-date, government revenues just about half our total. 
Adjusted EBITDA in government grew 13% and 27% to $78 million and $222 million, respectively, for the third quarter and year to date. Strong performance across the product portfolio drove the top-line growth in the third quarter. Year-to-date, higher services revenue also added to growth. Year-to-date, contract awards reached $865 million, and we ended the third quarter with $928 million of backlog in this segment. Unawarded IDIQ contract value is about a billion, 1.1 billion as of Q3, and that's not including the backlog figure. Growth year to date has been better than our expectations, boosted by strong demand and government fiscal year and seasonality. In government systems, we're aiming to augment a defense procurement system that's stressed by an incredibly broad threat spectrum uh, with rapid technical advances. We built closer working work close working relationships with our nation's global first responders. They encounter new threats and have the skills and agility to learn to overcome them. Then we help migrate the products and services proven in that environment to the much larger regular Air Force, Navy, and Army. We're also working with coalition partners who leverage interoperability with U.S. forces. So almost all the Link 16 products that we show on this slide are non-developmental items meaning we invented, productized, and support them ourselves, often directly with end-user combatant organizations in response to specific operational needs, and reduce the lead times they'd see by as much as a decade or more. The products have been effective and interoperate using standards. That creates powerful network effects. That is, all the Link 16 users find their connections to be more valuable as new users, platforms, and operational processes join the network. We're enabling the number of network-enabled platforms and devices to grow by orders of magnitude, from thousands to tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands. We're still in the early innings of the transformations needed by the U.S. Defense Department. While this slide focuses on Link 16, we have similar opportunities in other areas, too. We believe the biggest growth is still in front of us. The Space Force, with a mandate for faster innovation to address the rapidly evolving space threat environment, as well as new operational models, is indicative of the need for change. We're earning placements of customized, secure Viasat satellite terminals on a broad range of operational platforms that can support both DOD organic satellites as well as Viasat 3 networks. We're steadily building a diversified global population of terminals ready to leverage Viasat 3 and beyond bandwidth. Government services are over 20% of total government system segment revenue. Within that, there's an aero mobility services business that is comparable in revenue to our commercial in-flight connectivity business and also growing fast. We're earning positions on more fixed and rotary wing platforms representing the early adopters of fleets of thousands of aircraft. Government business is inherently lumpy, and financial results will vary on a quarterly basis, but we believe the growth trends that have driven our results for the last several years can endure and even increase in the Viasat 3 era. Turning to satellite services, here we reported $212 million and $614 million in Q3 and year-to-date revenue. Gains of 19% and 24% year over year, respectively. Adjusted EBITDA was 75 million and 213 million in the third quarter and year to date. Increases of 33% and 63% year over year, respectively. That's the eighth consecutive quarter of sequential revenue growth. An ARPU gain of about 15% drove residential revenue, while total revenue benefited from a 23% year-over-year increase in in-flight connectivity tails to 13.79 at the end of the third quarter, and that includes about 97.37 max planes. As of Q3 end, we had about 690 additional aircraft we expect to install under existing contracts. Together, that totals to an increase of about 120 more planes in the third quarter. And that's derived from our expansion into South America with Azul Airlines, as well as additional planes from existing customers. And we've already accomplished our first flights with Azul. So you can see in the chart in the lower left that while our U.S. residential business has grown rapidly, our newer vertical and geographic markets continue to grow even faster. 
And on a last 12-month basis, they've reached 25% of our satellite services revenue, over double the proportion of four years ago. We strongly believe that more diversity, both geographically and by vertical market, is the key to global growth in the resilient, optimal service business. For the U.S. fixed market, we've consistently emphasized ARPU growth over subscriber count with Viasat 2. That's worked really well. The approximate cash benefit to date of this strategy compared to a constant ARPU higher subcount approach is already in the range of a couple hundred million dollars. We've grown ARPU by offering higher priced, higher value plans that have increased satisfaction and reduced churn. Don't misinterpret those results as meaning the satellite addressable market is small or saturated. We think the opposite. The addressable market depends on offered price and performance compared to terrestrial alternatives. We're currently addressing only the high end, which is apparently pretty big. We could choose a different approach with Viasat 3, triangulating from multiple directions, including the existing DSL subscriber base, Demand for higher speeds and more bandwidth as people switch from broadcast to over-the-top video, preliminary beta tests of our hybrid low-latency services, and demand at our current price points, it's reasonable to estimate a satellite-addressable U.S. consumer market in the 20-ish million range. Obviously, for anyone to target a market of that size, the competition's really terrestrial, and the appeal would be delivering better video quality, uh, better quality video streaming. We believe we can compete well for streaming video among the underserved. Today, we announced a partnership with Fubo TV, a sports and news-focused live TV streaming service that focuses on improving quality and quantity for both live and uh, streaming video on demand services over the internet. And they're leveraging technical specifications developed by the Streaming Video Alliance. We'd encourage you to read that release. It emphasizes the in-flight connectivity market, but the same principles can apply to fixed services. We've been developing the technology for a while and contributing to the standards process, and now we're seeing adoption. The main reason we focused on higher-end plan service plans is to get better at streaming video. The streaming video lines protocols can help content providers improve end-user experience substantially while reaching literally hundreds of millions of users over satellite in places that are otherwise inaccessible for the best over-the-top services. So the bottleneck for services growth for us or any other player in our markets is bandwidth. We see plenty of demand given the right vertical and geographic markets and the right price points, but even though we have the most bandwidth in the market, bandwidth is still a constraint for a differentiated service, and having a strong diversified portfolio gives us the best opportunity of optimizing the value of our assets across the broad range of demand characteristics we'll see globally, driven by geography, regulatory politics, and other distinctions in each part of the world. So this slide about Viasat Const uh, 3 Constellation is really about this is the way to get more bandwidth. All three satellites are in full swing. The figure on the slide shows a simplified schedule. The fully shaded segments are completed for the first two satellites. The first satellite is in payload assembly and test. The gradient fill is intended to show approximately where we are in the overall process. The brackets under the schedule divided into two main portions. The first is Viasat 3 payload unique, and the second is more standard for our Boeing 702 spacecraft. The payload build, assembly, and test is the portion with the greatest uncertainties, the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns, if you will. And schedule pressure has come mostly from subcontractor, subcontractor production schedule performance in this portion. We've taken steps to mitigate those issues and are now integrating subassemblies onto the payload module. We're aiming to deliver the first payload module to Boeing by fall of this calendar year. After that, the program uses standard processes for integration and test of the spacecraft and the launch campaign, similar to Viasat 2. Payload module delivery is an important milestone in reducing overall schedule risk and achieving a mid-2021 launch date. The Viasat 3 program is built on innovative new technology, and with it comes many challenges, but we've made great progress and we're systematically retiring schedule and performance risks. 
We expect the system to meet its coverage and performance objectives. While there's always scheduled risks with space programs, we believe we're driving towards completion and narrowing those risks to be measured in weeks and months, not in quarters or years. So this next slide helps illustrate the magnitude of the opportunity created by Viasat 3. The left-hand portion of the graph shows trailing 12-month revenue on a quarter-by-quarter -quarter basis since we entered the satellite services business with the Wild Blue acquisition. The growth rate inflection points that line up with Viasat 1 and Viasat 2 are obvious. Viasat 2 showed even sharper gains in total revenue growth rate. We label the time interval from now to Viasat 3 as the Viasat 2 runway, where we're achieving good growth momentum. The black line that starts in the lower left and turns sharply up with the launch of the Viasat 3 constellation is actual and projected bandwidth capacity on our fleet, with bandwidth measured in uh, gigabits on the right-hand axis. You can see an anticipated 8x increase with the Viasat 3 constellation in three roughly equal regional installments. The chart vividly reinforces the point that bandwidth is the fuel for growth. We've been very successful at defining, creating, and executing new business models that have already or are in the process of transforming each vertical segment with fixed residential, commercial in-flight connectivity, and government aeromobile being the three biggest examples. We're putting in place the remaining verticals for global expansion now. We're methodically expanding geographically. The productivity gains we can achieve create opportunities to transform end user experiences for bandwidth intensive applications. We have enough bandwidth productivity gains to share with customers while earning good returns for Viasat shareholders. We don't see a situation where the supply of bandwidth is too large. The aggregate demand across the entire portfolio is too great in the right geographic places. With the Viasat 3 architecture, we have a unique ability to allocate bandwidth in the most effective ways in geography and time. So this slide helps illustrate the point of the value of our applications portfolio. The world map approximately illustrates the coverage areas of the three regional Viasat 3 satellites that give almost total global coverage. They're labeled Flight 1, Americas, Flight 2, EMEA, and Flight 3, APAC. The APAC coverage wraps around the Pacific Ocean and overlaps the western edge of the America satellite over Alaska. Our coverage includes the transcontinental air routes. Coverage consists of many thousands of spot beams, but we don't show individual beams here so we can focus on the applications we expect to serve on the different satellites. The pyramid in the lower left shows the vertical markets that we've targeted so far quite successfully. We divide them into mobile, uh, that, and that part's colored blue, and fixed colored green. So by looking at the map, you can see the demand profiles in each of the three regions are quite distinct, with the shading indicating the relative amounts of fixed and mobile. North and South America are pretty interesting markets for residential because of the U.S., Canada, and to a growing extent, markets like Brazil and Mexico. There's a large emerging market community, uh, think of it as Wi-Fi, our community Wi-Fi, uh, similar to prepaid cellular in Latin America. Currently, the U.S. is the world's largest domestic air travel market and an important international destination. The Caribbean's an attractive cruise ship market, but there's not that much military activity. I mean, it's quite different. There's an attractive residential market in Western Europe but much of the rest of the region accesses the Internet via prepaid cellular, more like our community services. There's a pretty interesting regional aero market, but also a number of global carriers in the region who need global coverage. There's much more demand for U.S. government and coalition partner services in EMEA than in the Americas. APAC is different still. The most striking thing, of course, is the high proportion of ocean. The countries with high residential Internet penetration are so densely populated as to be poor satellite markets. Others are likely to be unavailable due to regulatory restrictions. Southeast Asia is attractive, and the Internet there is largely accessed through prepaid plans, such as our community services. 
There's a big opportunity for mobile satellite services in every segment, commercial, aero, maritime, and the government versions of those. The Pacific, the Pacific Ocean creates a big and technically challenging market. Our satellite architecture that lets us put large amounts of capacity only in the places and times that there's demand is a big advantage, as well as its geographic coverage, which is actually better than most of the non-geosynchronous filings that are out there. We're finding and forming valuable partnerships with important like-minded entities in each region as we grow our verticals. We list among these China SATCOM, Telebras in Brazil, and NBN in Australia. We have others that are not yet announced or are in process. Total demand among all these verticals in each market far exceeds our capacity or even the projected capacity for all the satellites under construction or planned. And delivering value in many of these verticals requires customization for each one with tight integration between service delivery, network management, and user terminal and platform integration. We believe we're the best position to compete in this type of complex space and service delivery environment. It's why we've been so focused on building and expanding our services portfolio. Okay, so let's turn to the Outlook side. Last quarter, we introduced the chart on the left, which has been updated for our most recent results. It shows trailing 12-month revenue and adjusted EBITDA over the last six quarters. Since the second quarter of fiscal 19, we've grown revenue by 28% and adjusted EBITDA by 90%. We believe the underlying market factors enabling this growth remain in place and they're listed in the points on the slide. Government systems business can be lumpy depending on timing of specific contracts, but it's been exceptionally strong this fiscal year. The factors we discussed remained in play. We're pleased with growth of the aero mobile business embedded in the services part of the government segment. Backlog strong, and our IDIQ and option portfolio is good. Satellite services is benefiting from scale and continuous process improvement. Financial results have been very good, and the fixed market for high-end services has been healthy. In-flight connectivity has exceptional growth potential as we aim to capture international market share along the lines of what we've achieved in North America. We have a number of opportunities in process. We're learning how to optimize and expand our community internet business. The logistics are challenging, but we're gaining strong partners, and demand appears to be healthy too. Overall, we're making good progress in establishing the expansive vertical market and geographic portfolio it'll take to capitalize on a global network. Even with the rapid uh, increase in EBITDA, we've been able to continue to make prudent investments for future growth. These are primarily in government systems, commercial, in-flight, community internet access, enterprise services, and international. We're metering our investments based on favorable market feedback while being mindful of our earnings objectives. Finally, we've made enough progress on payload unit build and test to be scaling up the payload assembly and test portion of the first Viasat 3. We're focused on completing the first Viasat 3 payload module and delivering it to Boeing for spacecraft integration. That'll be a major milestone toward the first launch as we enter a phase of the program that uses proven processes. Also today, uh, we announced the addition of Dr. Teresa Wise to our board of directors. Teresa holds a PhD in applied math from Cornell, and she's been chief information officer for Northwest Airlines and then for Delta Airlines. She'll add insight on information technology, data analytics, asset optimizations, and on helping best serve our airline partners. We're really pleased to have her with us. So that's it for our prepared remarks. We're really pleased with our overall progress this fiscal year and see the underlying business factors creating a strong foundation for Q4, for fiscal 21, and into the Viasat 3 era. So we'll be happy to take questions now. Certainly. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have a question at this time, please press star, then 1 on your telephone. If your question has been answered or you wish to remove yourself from the queue, please press the pound key. Our first question comes from the line of Philip Cusick with J.P. Morgan. Hey, guys. Thanks. Um, you know, first, Mark, you already talked about government, but can you dig further for us into that revenue stream and talk about relative margins between product and service streams? And of that product stream, how much is some kind of recurring revenue versus one-time product and IP sales? What's the book-to-bill um, sort of mix within that backlog that was very strong as well? And you, you mentioned government network effects. 
What are the synergies of having these different businesses inside one company? Thanks. Oh boy. <laughs> okay. Okay. So we'll, uh, we'll start. We'll, I think we'll answer some of the ones we can answer. The uh, so the uh, let's, let, let's talk about. Uh, we're not going to break out product and service margins separately. Uh, the you know in general the service margins are going to be healthier because they they are uh, building on uh, a, an asset base that we have where the products are are really more. Uh, you know, they're they're they have more of a cost of goods sold component, less of that uh, amortized fixed asset component to them. So that's going to make the margins look look better. On the product side, the you know the the revenues are generally driven by product shipments. When if you think of a recurring uh, revenue portion of that, what what makes the products valuable is that all of the organizations that use the same operational concepts or, uh, you know, weapon systems or interoperate with each other are going to need the same products in order to interoperate. So, so one of the ways you can sort of gauge what the recurring revenues will be is by looking at the organ, you know, the size of the organizations or the platforms that use them or the number of platforms. So if we're integrated on things like you know, F-18s or on uh, Apache helicopters or custom helicopters, you can count up. You, you can count up the, the market sizes there and anticipate that uh, we'll we'll have shipments to cover all those as well as uh, spares. The the uh, thing that we keep referring to that's helped grow uh, sales is that we're evolving to larger and larger organizations and. Uh, addressing platforms that have many more, you know, many more uh, numbers than some of the other platforms. So that's the thing where we go from since uh, with our uh, we used to do what we used to call mids LVTs or mids JTRSs. We go to small tactical terminals, a lot more small tactical terminals. We go to handhelds, there are many more handhelds. As we integrate weapons, there's uh, potential for many, many more weapons. Uh, when we talk about the network effects, uh, and, and I can refer to them in the Link 16 environment. You, you know, the, the, the definition network effects is that when you add more uh, members to the network, that the network becomes more valuable for all participants. And, and the way that happens here is that each of these participants think of them as a source of sensor information. They, they, that is, they contribute to the network, which makes that information more valuable to the other participants, or they can act on the information within that network uh, in a way that makes the information within the network more valuable. So when people contribute to it, if they can see other participants act on that, that that's increased the value to them. And that, as we expand the participants in the way we showed in that figure, you can certainly see the uh, the, the network effects there. We have those in other areas of the business. Uh, I, it's, I think this isn't the, time, the place to, to elaborate on that too much. Thanks, I think Mark. I covered most, <laughs> most of the questions. Most of it. Mark, Mark yeah. yeah, this is Rick. There's one more. We have almost zero kind of non-recurring you know, licensing or IP type purchases. Okay, thanks. Thank you. And our next question comes from the line of Rich Valera with Needham and Company. Thank you. Um, a couple more questions on the government business. Um, so you had a nice BATS, uh, BATS D order with the Air Force, um, and, and in that press release you noted that you'd ship 2,500 of those units into the field. Just wondering how you think of the kind of potential TAM for that product against that 2,500. You know, what's your sort of penetration rate? And if you were thinking over the next five or ten years, like what what might be the penetration of that of that potential TAM? So a lot of uh, okay, a lot of that depends on the uh, the way that, let's say the growth trajectory and adoption of the Link 16 products. What you know what those uh, what this press release was about was uh, joint tactical air controllers who are people on the ground who are coordinating uh, close air support. So as we get more 
uh, more of the Link 16 terminals on more airborne platforms, that increases uh, the potential for ground-based applications of it. And so both of those things, as you get more ground-based applications of it, they can better use the uh, airborne platforms that are supporting them. So, you know, right now we refer to the market for that as kind of in the tens of thousands. It's possible it'll break through into the hundreds of thousands, but if it does, we'll report on the events that occur that that would cause that to happen. And I guess relatedly, can you give us a status update on the Link 16 LEO constellation that um, you, you've been sort of doing the early work on? Yep, right now, so right now the... Uh, the main work is on building that first prototype satellite and coming up with operational concepts that would translate the capabilities of the prototype into uh, an operational constellation. So I would say for the next year-ish, we're going to be really concentrated, focused more on the, the prototype satellite itself, uh, which you know, right now, I, I, I mean, it's the program's kind of still in the early to middle stages. Uh, I don't want to comment yet on an expected launch date, but with these small satellites, it's not going to be, it's not years. Uh, it'll, it'll be closer than, it'll be shorter than years. And we'll, we'll, we can give an update on that in the next quarter or two. Okay. And I just wanted to pivot to the commercial side and get maybe a more in-depth update on your uh, rural Wi-Fi um, activities in, uh, in Mexico and Brazil. If you can just, you, you mentioned some, it's kind of logistical challenges, but um, I'm sure there's been some successes as well. So if you could just give us a sense of sort of how, how the progress is there and, and any color would be appreciated. Okay. Yeah, the, the kind of the first most important, most important thing that we wanted to find out is if, if you drop, uh, you know, Wi-Fi, you know, let's say pay-per-use Wi-Fi into these very rural towns and villages, do people care? Like, do, do, does it matter? Do, do, do people want to use it? Uh, and uh, and what are the trade-offs that they see between coverage, uh, you know, price and performance? And so uh, I'd say what we've learned is, yes, they care. Uh, I'd say they care a, a lot. Uh, the challenges that when we refer to logistical challenges, they're really around things like, uh, remember, you're, you're putting these small terminals into a town. Can we make sure that the terminal is on the air all the time? That uh, that we do the that we can uh, support it, cash collection, make sure that the residents there understand how to use it. Uh, those are those are what I would call logistical challenges. Uh, the other, and then there are other things around the exact forms of the service plans. That we that we offer, and uh, right now they're really more okay. You could buy internet by the hour, but we expect that we're going to offer tailored plans that are kind of more like what you see in, in the sophisticated uh, prepaid uh, cellular environment. The other, and then the other things we're trading off are around uh, coverage and capital investments and how to evolve those. That's, that's what I would say. The things we focused on the most, and, and, and Sean mentioned this, is it, it, do people care? Will they use it? Measuring the way they use it, the, uh, let's say, the friction on adoption or the limits to usage. There, there's, a, there's a lot to work with there, uh, and, but we're, I'd say we're, uh, overall, we're encouraged because of the, the the demand. That is, you look at over time in the towns that are connected. In general, you see more and more use, not you know, not less. And that's that's probably the most important thing right now. Got it. Okay. Thanks, Mark. I'll, I'll yield the floor. Thanks, Rich. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Louis De Palma with William Blair. Good afternoon, Mark and team. Hey, Louis. Um, How are you? Sean. Not not bad. Um, Sean, with the elevated CapEx, do you have a ballpark sense on where your net debt will peak before you turn free cash flow positive? Yeah, I think what um, probably the way I would characterize it for you guys is just is 
kind of looking at where we think the free cash flow positive is going to turn and what we think kind of, you know, our, our, our leverage levels will be. You know, I think we've said, um, you know, we'd expect to be, you know, in the three and a half range, you know, throughout this year, uh, give or take, and expect it to increase, you know, a little bit over to next year because we're going to be scaling up on the Biosat 3 constellation, starting the third satellite. Uh, we'll start to scale a little bit, but stay in comfortable ranges throughout the build. So I kind of put that as a backdrop. And then the overall, you know, I think we've said free cash flow positive about two years after the first satellite, and that's where we think we're still seeing it. Right. And, to, and just to add to that, the, the reason we characterize it the way Sean described is because we have knobs and levers to manage it that way. Oh, yeah. that, that's the Right. That's the way we're going to manage it. Okay. And do you have a sense on what's going to be the normalized CapEx level post Viasat 3? Uh, well, <laughs> I think that's a, you know, a little bit more, uh, you know, dependent on on the next generation, you know, satellite and, and where we're going to next. Obviously, right now, we're in an elevated state because we're building three uh, satellites at one time. So, you know, I don't expect that, that we're going to stay at these levels uh, and that you tick down to a little bit more normalized before kind of this this run up, but uh, you know that that's going to pace a little bit on some of the opportunities we see in the future and what the pace of the next gen is. Okay, and, and the uptake rates on and the uptake rates on the satellites, and that's and the yeah. investments uh, that we yeah. make there. Yep. Yeah. Okay, and and Mark, um, Starlink had some news today, and I I was wondering how large do you guys estimate is the international rev- revenue pie that you, Starlink, OneWeb, and then the traditional players like Inmarsat, SES, Utelsat, and Intelsat will be theoretically sharing after Viasat 3 is, is completed? Well, uh, so we, you know, we've given some insight. You've got, you've, what you've got to do is you've got to add up all of these different markets right, that we're addressing, and that's you know fixed residential enterprise, uh, the commercial aero market, the um, uh, government market, and especially, and especially this community Wi-Fi market. But you know, I'm not going to I'm not going to put a number out there. I would say it is it's. It's tens of billions of dollars. I mean, it's at least in that range, right, that's going to be divided up among us. But I don't think we're going to go into more depth than that on this call. But it's big. And I think we have given insight into, uh, you know, parametric ways to look at it. For instance, you can look at in-flight connectivity and see that growing to, you know, from four to seven-ish billion annual passengers and think of revenue opportunities in the, one, two, three dollars a passenger, depending on on how you uh, how you can attack the market. You look at and you know estimate hundreds of millions of people that we can address in these uh, community Wi-Fi businesses. Look at dollars in the prepaid mobile market. You look at dollars of uh, revenue per user per month. As uh, as benchmarks, those, those are the way you construct it. But you usually get to to these tens of billions of dollars numbers, and and we expect that we're going to be near the that we're going to be among the leaders in dividing up that pie, not near the end, not near the back of the line. Sounds good. And and one last one, your your mid JTRS contract vehicle has been a very large contributor for you, and it's generally been upsized every six months. Do you expect a new IDIQ after the existing one soon ends in, in May of 2020? Yeah, there are plenty of... Uh, yes, yes, we do. Yes. Sounds good. Thanks, Mark and Sean. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Mike Crawford with B. Riley. Um, thanks. Um, from the 
rising equity and net income affiliates line, it looks like your Trellisware subsidiary is probably doing quite well. Can you just talk about what's going on with that waveform and the uh, maybe potential network effect uh, possibilities with uh, Trellisware? Yes. So uh, when we talk about network effects, that's a really good example. Uh, what Trellisware has developed is a uh, – a waveform that's being adopted by the Army for several of their, both the special forces and the Army for several of their uh, common radio programs, uh, man-packed and handheld radios. Uh, and that, and Charlesware has a business model where those uh, waveforms are licensed into uh, other contractors uh, that are scaling up production. So what's happening is licensing revenue is growing uh, pretty pretty rapidly there. We're pretty excited about about that. There's a good growth runway there, and you see some of that reflected in our portion of you know in our uh, that that we consolidate in there based on uh, our little over 50 percent ownership of Trellisware. That, uh, and then from a network effects perspective, again, a, a big part of what makes those radios valuable is interoperability. So the fact that large numbers of users are adopting them is helping to drive uh, adoption of those waveforms, basically very broadly across Special Forces, Army, and Marines as well. Okay, um, thank you. And then if we could just turn back to these satellite services um, markets, both mobile and fixed, that you're targeting along with some of these Leo constellations. Um, you know, obviously, if someone's going to try to play Fortnite, you know, maybe that latency matters there. But in terms of ability to deliver high speed and high bandwidth, how how does – do you, uh, I guess, weigh the – Limitations or, or 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 not of some of these of like OneWeb, Starlink, Kuiper versus um, you know Visat three and Visat four. Okay, so uh, our, our position has been pretty consistent. If you if there, you have enough bandwidth, latency is really important. If you don't have enough bandwidth, then latency isn't as important because you have congestion and other effects that mask latency. We think the big driver in uh, in addressing the biggest market, uh, you know, which is like these 20 million-ish people on DSL and the people that are trying to be addressed uh, by subsidies is the switch from broadcast video to over-the-top video. And the demand is enormous. We think there are big advantages to our architecture in delivering bandwidth the most cost-effectively. We've spent tons mm -hmm. of time... Uh, evaluating all these other ones, and yes, they're going to. We're really we're excited to see innovation in the industry. We're involved with a lot of these non-geosynchronous Leo and Neo systems in one way or another. But uh, we, and I think we understand them well. We're really confident in our approach is going to be the most scalable and cost-effective. Okay. Uh, uh, this is Bruce. That's going to have to be our last question uh, for tonight. Um, I apologize, but but uh, we have some uh, some time constraints. All right, anyway. ladies and ladies and gentlemen, we would like to thank you for participating in today's conference. This does conclude the program, and you may all disconnect. Everyone, enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>